good interactive discussions, and I'm sure we'll keep on going today. It's uh, a pleasure for me to introduce the first speaker. Nobody has to introduce him, Hartwig Hulan from Hamburg, and he will give us an overview about the last 30 years of radical prostatectomy. Where do we stand? Yes, thank you. Dear Franz, thank you for inviting me. Thanks a lot for the wonderful meeting, Dr. Kierkowski. A big compliment for your organization, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here. And in the, as a matter of fact that I have only 15 minutes, I will concentrate on three aspects, on anatomy, continence, potency, some words, and oncology, where do we stand today. I will start with two very, very old slides showing you what we have known 20, 30 years ago. You may see and diagnose that this should be the prostate. In the textbooks of that year, we all know this is one of the best textbooks, it was shown in this way, and every single detail, as we know today, is wrong. There is no thick capsule, it's not a homogeneous gland, the ducts of the glands don't go everywhere in the urethra, only here, and uh, the urethra doesn't go straight through the prostate. It was John McNeil who told us what we know today, I don't have to go to any details of this, up, uh, this uh, slide, because it's our daily practice, we know that the prostate looks like that and not as shown before. The other old slide I want to show you to show, demonstrate what we have known 30 years ago is this of the famous Willard Whitmore, the grand old man of the world, man of urologic oncology at the MSKCC, showing that prostate carcinoma is not only an unpredictable tumor, he said it is the unpredictable tumor. And the reason why he said that at that year is that he had only two instruments to classify in each patient the stage of the disease, the palpating finger and the bone scan. And sometimes he couldn't palpate anything but the bone scan found positive, so he concluded that it could easily go from A to D, from A to C, a complete unpredictable tumor. And again, I have to talk about John McNeil, and I think this is one of the basic studies for the, for the modern view of the biology of uh, prostate carcinoma, he did an autopsy study and he found, like many others before him, especially Franks in uh, London, that 40% of men have a prostate carcinoma. But for the first time, he did volumetric study. And in the 100 prostate carcinoma cases which he found, he uh, estimated the volume of each cancer and put it in the order of the volume on this <laughs> diagram. And you can easily show that 80% of, there are two informations, 80% of these cancers, 90% if we include those who had no cancers, have a small cancer, smaller than 0.5 cubic centimeter. And this was the birthday of the so-called histologic insignificant cancer. And the other important information came from here that he could see that it, it requires a certain volume of prostate cancer. He said about five, six cubic centimeters before he find red points. Red points mean that they already have metastasis. And a few years later, uh, this classic paper was done by the Stanford group by Tom Stamey, my mentor and teacher, and John McNeil, looking in 326 peripheral zone cancer after radical prostatectomy to nine morphologic parameters. John McNeil did this very, very carefully and could show that the outcome, cured or not cured, correlates extremely with the volume of the bad cancer and the volume of the whole cancer. And this, again, was, a basis, was, a, was again the basis of what we use now in daily practice. Uh, we all know that the father of all nomograms is Michael Catan. This was the first one in which he published 1990. 1990. And uh, on the basis of only three preoperative parameters, clinical parameters, PSA, clinical stage, and biopsy glees and some, he was able to predict very precisely using nomograms the five-year outcome after radical prostatectomy. And I think now we have more than 100 such nomograms. And today we use it, this is our standard today, we use it in daily practice in each patient. 
We have this paper on the wall with all the details of the patient, and we calculate on the basis of nomograms if it is a significant cancer, lymph node state if it is positive, if we might have uh, capsular penetration on each side uh, separately uh, done by, uh, with nomograms, 10-year outcome, and if we might expect upgrading. And we call it now nomographic staging. And this will be the state of the art until, of course, maybe in one day, if uh, imaging would be so good that we don't need that anymore. Continents potency. It was Bob Myers, and I think, and I have to state that most of what I know today about anatomy I learned from Bob Myers. He had de really done wonderful work. We know that continents uh, relies to 90% on this important organ, the membranous urethra, and we learn from him that this uh, membranous urethra is very short, 2.1 centimeter, and we have to save this important organ in that direction, I call it horizontal direction, and in the longitudinal direction. In the horizontal, this is nothing new, we do that all, I think. Uh, we uh, do a selective suturing of the dorsal venal complex, and this is possible because the veins run between two membranes, the fascia of the striated uh, muscle, and on top of it, the visceral part of the endopedalic fascia. This is not new, I think it's standard. But this was very, very impressive work, the one uh, which impressed me most in the last years concerning continence after radical prostatectomy. On MRI studies, this Korean group uh, showed that up to 40% of the membranous urethra can be covered by the apex, sometimes uh, by the anterior or posterior part or ventral or dorsal part, sometimes only by the anterior part, sometimes by the posterior part, and sometimes not covered. The whole membranous urethra is outside. And when we, all, when we do what we all did, cut here, cut here, cut here, this was the beauty of this study. He could then also show in a multivariate analysis that the results of um, uh, surgery in respect to postoperative continence was best in this situation. And this stimulated us to develop a new operative technique where we try to explore in each patient and uh, every apex, I see it from then on, is really different, has different shapes. We made some paintings here according to the MRR study, studies from Lee, and we call it uh, uh, individually adapted intraprostatic apex preparation to make it only short. I don't want to give you all the figures. For the first time, we had in 71% continence after one week, or one week after we removed the catheter, without any negative impact on the positive margin rate. And the one-year positive, uh, the one-year continence rate is in the range of 97%. So far, the continence potency. We all this is old uh, stuff. I may say, uh, Pat Walsh and Peter Donker were the one we all know that uh, to explore and find the nervi arrogantes again. This is a study from Lepore at that time, showing that the nerves are only at the five and uh, seven o'clock position on the dorsal lateral aspect. Many studies, including our own, uh, I should mention here also Castello and many others, have shown later on that the nerves go up to the lateral side. And, uh, the, uh, and I think this, again, was a study, a Japanese study, which impressed me very, very much. We had, didn't have so far no proof if the lateral nerves also are of importance. And what they did in this wonderful study they did intraoperative uh, nerve stimulation. They had a pressure transducer in the membranous urethra, a balloon, and uh, then they stimulate at 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and uh, stimulating all this nerve, even the anterior lateral nerves, they got some pressure response, the best, of course, uh, when they stimulate the nerves at the 5 and 7 o'clock position. And this was a basis, again, that worldwide a high incision was done to preserve the neurovascular bundle. Inter, we do it intravascular, and we, you may call it a veil of Aphrodite. I think we don't need such a term. In doing so, we have excellent results uh, in terms of post-operative uh, potency in those who have been potent before. We all evaluated them before. If they have a score more than 19. Then, uh, in, in, uh, in, depending on the different age groups, depending if you do nerve sparing bilateral or unilateral, you have uh, ability to perform intercourse in 92 percent, 
to 63% depending on age group and bilateral and so on. So far, everything was clear. I was happy and I thought that is the end of the story. But suddenly, the book is opened up again. With this terrible paper, wonderful paper, wonderful terrible paper uh, from the last year in, from a French group, in contrary to what we have all done with the anatomic, anatomical studies, they looked where the nerve runs distally from the apex, going all the way to the penis. And surprisingly, they showed that the dorsal nerves are the ones who go to the corpus cavernosum, and that the nerves, which we preserve all the time on the dorsal lateral aspect, goes to the spongiosum. It confuses me a lot. Have we done everything wrong? The end of the story is not, uh, I don't have the answer yet. I have a preliminary information from, uh, ah, from Leipzig. No. They did, um, obviously, they did some study and could show that uh, the, uh, those, these nerves are mainly sympathetic nerves and these are parasympathetic. But what we plan now in the next weeks to do intraoperative stimulation to see what will, be, will happen if we stimulate these versus these. So the book is still open. Stolzenburg, yeah, you're right. Uh, this is for me the most important part of my presentation. Uh, we all uh, worked with the question, how can we identify safely those where we can do the nerve sparing or those where we cannot do it? In the past, we used nomograms. We do a clinical parameter. To make the long story short, for two or three years now, I do in 100%, in 100%, and we all do it at the Martini Clinic, intraoperative frozen section. We call it NeuroSafe. What we do is, in, in every case where we've done the nerve spare, we cut here the whole part of the prostate, um, as you can see here, do a different painting inside and outside. And uh, Dr. Zauter will tell you more about it in his presentation. I will give you only, yes, this I have to say, it takes 30, 40 minutes before this nice guy from Switzerland changes his clothes and looks to the microscope and we have a result of the cancer is gone to the outside or not. In this time, for those who consider uh, intraoperative uh, frozen section, we do the uh, lymph adenectomy so, so we don't lose time. So it can be done without a loss of time for the uh, operation. And I will give only uh, two information. The main uh, advantage from my point of view is that we do the nerve sparing using interoperative frozen section more often. We do it in 96% of all of our patients, 99% of the PT2 tumors, 80% bilateral, 19% uh, unilateral. Here is the other way around. They almost all are unilateral, of course. Number one, we do it more often. And just for comparison, uh, if we compare it with our old data, or this is a very well-known center, as you all know, using cl only clinical criteria, you end up in doing in 50-60% of PT2 tumors, certainly candidates for bilateral nerve sparing, uh, nerve sparing. So the one advantage is you do it more often, and there is always a question, is there a risk uh, in terms of oncology, the answer simply is no. We have a lot of data. We will publish it pretty soon. The positive margin rate uh, goes, is reduced by 50%. But what counts is, of course, the PSA follow-up. And this is very important. We compared those who had primarily uh, no negative surgical margin with those PT2, PT3 tumors where they had positive margin in the frozen section where we then removed the uh, neurovascular bundle on that side and could show that they are, have the same uh, PSA recurrence rates, the same oncologic outcome. But there's a lot of, lot of data. I think Guido Sauter will also give some comments on that. Finally, oncology, where do we stand today? Uh, we all know that we cure a great deal of PSA-detected tumors. This study from uh, our institution uh, I show because we evaluated only those where we each single patient had a follow-up of at least 10 years. So it's not calculated 10 years, it's real 10 years and more follow-up. 
And there we could show what we know all about from other studies from the literature, that we have a high cure rate in PT2 tumor, 87%. 50% of the PT3A, 26% of the PT3 tumor. This is not new, but it's very well documented. And this translates to an excellent um, cancer-specific survival data you all know from the literature. What is new, not real new, what uh, was a change in the paradigm uh, in the last five, six years, the, in the old days, 10 years ago, we thought we cannot cure by radical prostatectomy the locally advanced disease. Uh, but how, whatever the definition is, if you define it as PSA more than 20, if you define it as Dummico high risk group, if you define it as clinical T3 or biopsy in the Gleason uh, 8 to 10 in the biopsy, we, in, uh, this is a multi center study uh, together with the MSKSC and the uh, Cleveland Clinic, we could show that in uh, 26 to 42 percent, we can cure those locally advanced disease uh, using the 10-year follow-up, PSA follow-up. We, we didn't below that before. I, I think you're, everyone in this room knows that 10 years ago. This is a change in paradigm, I think. In addition, uh, we made the observation, uh, like many others uh, did also, and this is a very interesting finding in terms of biology of the prostate cancer. In the old days, we looked over about 100 patients where we, uh, sorry, 50 patients where we uh, started the operation with a lymphadenectomy, and when the lymph nodes were positive, we stopped, so we left the prostate in. Later on, as you all know, we removed those, in, even in those cases, the prostate. So we had the chance to compare these two groups, and we did it certainly in a match control group because this is a historical comparison. This is a match control, and as you can see, these are the curves for those where the prostate is removed, lymph node positive, not removed, lymph node positive. And the cancer progression-free survival and the disease-specific survival prolongs tremendously, it's years, it's not months, it prolongs for three or four or five years if the prostate is taken out in those where the lymph node is positive. Very interesting finding in terms of tumor biology. What is this? And I hope we find answer for that. And as a result of this, we sh uh, see a change in our uh, mig migration, um, uh, uh, in our uh, stage migration, in the beginning, as in many other centers in the world, we had only 30% PT2 tumors, then it went up here, then it went up to 80%. But including now more advanced disease, number one, and doing watchful waiting in the very early stages, it results in a, a inverse stage migration, having now only 11% poor Gleason 3x3 three three, and only 60% PT2 tumors. Certainly, the, we all know that radical prostatectomy is a safe operation. I don't give you all the data from Clavian classification, but just to make it very, very brief, in, from the last 5,000 cases, we had zero mortality injury of ureter or rectum is in per mil uh, uh, area, uh, less than 5% blood transfusion, but we all know that this is surgeon dependent. And this is very well documented, not only for this operation, for many, many other operations, that uh, we have a learning curve. This is a study from the MSKCC telling us that uh, after 250 for each surgeon, the uh, results became stable, better, better, better in the learning curve and, uh, after 250 stable. So there is an MPIC certainly from the surgeon on any types of result, oncologic outcome, functional outcome. We all know that. And there's another trend, and this is my, the end of my story. Uh, we operate older patients. Uh, most of you in the room maybe remember that there was a time that we hesitate to operate a man older than 70 years. Uh, we compared our data from 2002, where indeed 93% of our patients were younger than 70, only 6.7 in the age of 70, 75, and none older. And this, and this changed. Uh, now 90% are uh, older than 70 years, and the reason for that is that there's a demographic tendency 
the, the life expectancy in men increases every year, uh, two to three months. And I got this interesting data from the Max Planck Institute in Rostock, who is specialized on demographic research and uh, giving us the mean life expectancy for those who are 65, 70, and 75. But the most important information is this. In each group, there are 25% of the healthiest. And if you are 65, 70, or 75, and belong to this 25 healthiest group, they all get 90. So this is a good basis for judgment in the individual cases if you should treat or not treat. So in conclusion, as concerning biology, it is a heterogeneous but a fairly good predictive tumor. It could be better. We, I didn't mention anything about PSA. The cure rate is in PSA detected tumor 70 to 90 percent, and even in locally advanced, it is between 20, uh, 30 and 42 percent. Morbidity is minimal. Perioperative mortality uh, approach is zero, but we still have problems in respect to etiology. We don't know the etiology yet. This is the reason why we don't have a very effective prevention. We certainly look for better and specific marker and prognostic marker to avoid overtreatment, better prediction of life expectancy. Uh, the imaging is coming up, but uh, is not perfect yet, and therapy of uh, hormonal refractory cancer is a subject. For the first time, and this is my last slide, I have the hope that at least some of these questions will be answered pretty soon. There is an uh, activity going on called ECGC, for those who are not familiar with it, it's Internal International Consortium of Gene uh, Cancer Genome Project. And uh, uh, basic science of all over the world try to analyze the gene of 50 tumors from each tumor, 500 pieces, uh, examples. And uh, the German government uh, uh, supports three projects in Germany, the red ones here, uh, uh, pediatric brain tumor, lymphoma, and prostate, and the head of the uh, German Prostate Cancer Project, which is in cooperation with the Martini Clinic, is sitting here and talking to us you know, this morning and giving maybe some details of this most interesting project. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? I do not have that many questions because I can ask him every day, so I'm in a like, serious position. But you have the unique chance to ask him now. First question. Thanks so much for the great talk. Um, did you try and compare with your positive frozen sections on margins whether retrospectively MRI could have helped you not to do those frozen sections? Because of course, it, you know, it's you have to destroy, so to say, the specimen, and then if you want to calculate the volume of the tumor, it might not be so easy. So I'm sure you don't do with all these frozen sections with the light heart, but would there be you know, some cases where we could spare this work on the prostate? Sure. I think this is a very important question, and uh, we, I can, to make the answer short, I cannot answer this so far, uh, but we uh, realize that MRR may help us a lot and in one day if it is very precise may uh, 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 be used instead of frozen section. Um, the fact that we uh, see it seriously, we plan to uh, uh, have an MRI in our Martini clinic just to answer this and, and other questions. Other questions, the MRI can give us uh, good details about the anatomy if the memory urethra really goes inside or not and can have a strong impact on our surgery. So not only uh, stage, uh, help in staging the tumor, but also anatomy, and also uh, hopefully one day uh, to identify those who have capsular penetration or not. So far, we, we haven't studied yet. I, I'm not aware that anyone has really studied that in detail in these great numbers. OK. Yeah, excellent talk. Thank you very much. Um, I have one remark. Uh, first, you know that we do a lot of study with comorbidity in my department, yeah. and life expectancy means that 50% of the people live 20 more years if they are 75, not all. 
only 50%. Good news for me. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's the fir first <laughs> remark. Uh, then, uh, then regarding, uh, again, uh, frozen sections. You know that around 30 years ago, Pat Walsh already did a study about frozen sections. In, it was a radical, not frozen section. He did the neurovascular bundle out if he thought on his pathologist who came always in his OR uh, that there is an, an infiltration. And only in 25% in he found uh, cells in these neurovascular bundles. That's the first thing. So, in, so he said it's not worthwhile doing, taking it out because in 75% we take it out and makes this patient impotent. The second thing is, if we have a positive margin in PD2 disease, and this has been shown by Claude Abou and others, that we have only a recurrence rate of around 30%. So in 70%, even if there is a positive margin, we have no PSA recurrence in the long run. And the third thing is, we have excellent second-line treatment in those patients, and this means therapy, and we can sterilize those problems locally in around 95% uh, later on. So why doing first frozen sections? Secondly, why taking part of the neurovascular bundles out uh, in those patients? I think before we can promote that, we should really need to do a prospective trial. And is this uh, what you showed here, because only 30% only have PSA recurrence, it could just those patients you are taking the neurovascular bundles out. So you need a good randomized trial to show that before we can promote that. That's my plea on that. We have done extensive uh, evaluation uh, concerning 11,000 uh, patients from our database, and this will be published pretty soon. I had only 50 minutes, so I couldn't go to all the details. Uh, Dr. Witt, you missed one important point. You don't know before you operate if it is a PT2 tumor. If I would know that, in PT2, in PT2 tumors, the advantage of a frozen section might not be that significant. But it is. Uh, our positive margin PT2 compared with uh, PT2 negative margin have a different BCR uh, uh, cure rate after 10 years. Uh, it's 90 versus 70 percent. It's something in that range. So at least 20% don't get radiation therapy. My main point, maybe I haven't made that clear, we do, not knowing the pathologic stage of our, 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 our uh, patients, we do the nerve sparing more often. We do it in 90% of PT3 tumors, unilateral, of course, and safe, extremely safe. And in 99% of PT2 tumors who turned out to be PT2 tumors, if you try to identify the P2 tumors by preoperative nomograms, you miss a lot PT2 tumors, and then you don't do the nursery. My main point, certainly it's a little bit safer. Certainly we cut down our positive margin rate by half. But my main point is we do the nerve sparing in 90, uh, more than 90% of all of our patients. This is the advantage. I, I actually completely agree. Uh, and we have to realize we are we are not only surgeons. We have to be surrounded by teams. We need great pathologists. We need great MRI people. And basically, it's a whole system. You've got Guido. Uh, we have Theo van der Kwaas, So, and we have also the MRI pre-op. We are ex doing exactly the same. Every single locally advanced will be with nerve sparing given the MRI and the frozen. And I think that it's the next step. Of course, as long as you have suboptimal pathology or people who do this from time to time, it's not organized, yes, it's not. you're going to say, oh, it doesn't work, and then you're going to have many myths, and then you will abandon it. But if, if you have a, a program where you integrate radiology and pathology, that, that's, for me, the only yeah. way to, to, to move Two remarks. Things. I realize uh, in future, imaging will be extremely better this nomographic staging will be history, whatever, and maybe even frozen section. And number two, uh, you may have missed it, you don't lose time during the operation. You can do the lymphadenectomy at the time you are waiting. This is detail, but it is not unimportant. Tulio. Uh, Professor Huland, I have two questions. One question is, how many times 
did the pathologist find tumor cells on the resected neurovascular bundle when he told you that the tumor is, uh, has a positive surgical margin? 30 percent. 30 percent. And how many times did you have an upgrade from a, a, a PT2 intraoperatively to a PT3, then in the definitive histology? Whew. So, Guido, so, uh, happy you are here. <laughs> <laughs> In the, in the uh, frozen uh, section situation, we're looking, we are looking at the lateral surfaces yes. of, the, of the prostate. And uh, then uh, we have, in, if this is positive, um, we have in 30% um, um, something in the bundle. And then it's uh, upgrading to PT3 automatically. Yeah? And sometimes we also see in other areas of the prostate that we um, have an invasion of the tumor that goes into the, um, in the fat uh, tissue surrounding the prostate, and then it can still be a PT3, but it's not usually then a very uh, um, um, intense PT3, yeah? I mean a very uh, yeah. a large tumor. Yeah? Well, I, I just refer to the, to the, to the public, uh, to, the, to the literature, because you have about 30% of, of uh, positive margins at the bladder neck, and you don't look at the bladder neck, you look just oh, at the... Oh, this, this is not a procedure to remove positive margin anywhere. Yeah, I, I know, I know, to, yeah. to but I would like to know, what is your, what is your upgrade then in terms of, of positive margins, uh, and where are these positive margins? Are they at, at the base of the prostate? Are they anteriorly? Yeah. This should be... <clears throat> If you, if you look to the literature, it should be about around 40% where you have your positive margins. They are not dorsolateral, they are not at the apex, but they are at the level of you the know, base uh, and, and Maybe and I anteriorly. can answer. Number one, we reduced the positive margin rate. I, I reduced in PT2 tumor, I personally, from 8 to 4%. And this reduction is due to the fact that I don't have positive margin where the neurovascular mm -hmm. bundle was. Be, uh, the last 44% in PD2 tumors are at the apex or at the base. Does this answer the question? Yes. Uh, Dr. Wert, I have a last argument for, for, for the frozen section. The surgeon sleeps better in the night. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a last, a last, question, a last question to you. If you do an in, intrafascial uh, nerve, nerve spurring, it, uh, inter? Intrafascial nerve yeah. spurring. How can you define that those patients have a PT3 disease? Uh, I cannot. I cannot. And this, uh, this again is helped by the frozen section. No, no, it, no. If you do an intrafascial one, yeah. how can you define that this was a PT3 disease? Because uh, if to define is, a PT3 disease, you need something outside of the prostate. Yes. But if you're just doing the nerve spurring at the prostate glands, and you do it. So how can you define a PD3? Oh, oh, yes, I think it's very simple to answer because if I do a nerve spurring on a site where there is a capsular penetration, then I have to have positive margin there. And then I reject the neurovascular bundle on that side. And this, that this uh, uh, approach is oncologic safe is shown by the slides I have uh, just shown you that those who have a negative margin primarily have the same results as those who had a positive margin. We removed the neurovascular bundle and turned then to a negative margin because we have taken out the neurovascular bundle on that side. And they have the same results as those who have primarily a negative margin. Maybe a final comment from Guido Sauter. He's the one who is assigning the pathologic stage. Now, actually, um, um, maybe I can just uh, give my presentation and then okay. we discuss Very this good. further because I, I, I'm not so sure that I can satisfy Dr. Wirt, so... <laughs> okay. I know. <laughs> okay, so um, we go to the next presentation, which is... Uh